leading us in their message and music this morning. We've been looking at a worship series in which we've looked at the, uh, the ministry of Jesus um, from many different angles. We looked at the call of, uh, of the disciples and Jesus' ministry of calling. We've looked at his, uh, his teaching and preaching. And uh, today we look at uh, the ministry of healing that is found here in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus' teaching and ministries of healing really go hand in hand. They're of the same ministry in the Gospel of Mark. Within the same week that he called his disciples to follow him, announcing the kingdom of God is at hand, he launches his public ministry in the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, and Jesus is establishing a pattern uh, that will be throughout the Gospel of Mark. Our passage makes clear this morning the connection between teaching, preaching, and healing. Listen with me for the good news found here in Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed of demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And Jesus cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Thanks be to God for this reading of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. There's many curious things about this, uh, this story, this passage in the Gospel of Mark. One thing that, that stands out to me is the great crowds uh, reference. Uh, clustering around the door of, uh, of Simon's house. Jesus only had performed a couple of healings and the Gospel of Mark tells us the whole city is gathered around. Good news travels fast, I guess, right? Good news about the cure of incurable illnesses, the healing of terminally ill, that would, uh, that would travel fast. Imagine today if, uh, if it was announced that a doctor at the University of Iowa hospitals had, uh, had found a cure, she had discovered a cure for cancer. If you were to, uh, to learn about this, you could be sure that, uh, that she would be crowded around as one that everyone would want to know. Um, do you know the streets of Iowa City would be full tomorrow if that was announced this afternoon? Uh, they'd fill Kinnick with, uh, with folks looking for an answer. Mark says that evening at sundown, they brought to him to Jesus, all who were sick and possessed with demons, and the whole city gathered at the door. What is Jesus' response to this success? What's his response to the success of all these people wanting to see him, to be cured by him? Well, he sneaks out at dawn in the darkness and he prays. That's his response to the success of his healing ministry. What? Is that it? That's what you're going to do? You're going to be that successful and then you're just going to sneak out and find a quiet place on your own. Jesus' disciples hunt him down. They can't believe that they've got to hunt him down. That's the actual words that, uh, that are in the Greek. Um, they're excited and they're saying, everyone's searching for you. So they've hunted him down because they want to bring him back to the crowds. You've got to help these people out. They've, they've crowded around the door of Simon's house. What's Jesus' response? Here he then says, let's, uh, let's get out of here. Let's go to the neighboring town uh, where I can preach because that's what I came out to do. Preach? 
Really? That's what? That's your response? Uh, you know, you, you've been doing all this healing and people want to see more healing. You've had success and now you're just going to go back to preaching in the neighboring towns. What, what gives? We and the disciples perhaps are a bit curious about Jesus' response to his success. You can understand the confusion of the disciples. They're thinking to themselves, uh, we've, we've only just begun in just a few days. You've only been preaching a short time. And look at the crowds. They're starting to, to follow you in big numbers. You're, you're becoming a su successful uh, business person here in the, in the healing realm. Let's stick with the healing. Forget the preaching. That's, uh, that's not what, what you should be about. Ride out the wave of success and fame. You've got to keep doing what's working. Dilly dilly, man. Dilly dilly. Right? You know, that kind of thing. Years ago, there was a, a prominent television evangelist uh, who ran into problems with the law and was imprisoned. And during that time, you could hear some of those who were condemning the man for his crimes. Uh, at the same time, there were others who were saying, well, lots of people, lots of people were, uh, were believing in his ministry. Uh, they were helped by him. You can't argue with the numbers. That's what they said about him. You can't argue about the crowds that he was able to have around him. Yet numbers, popularity, success, they bother Jesus more than they excite him. Why is that? Why is he not kind of focused on the success of this crowd at the door of Simon's house? He says he must go out and preach. That's what he came out to do in the first place, he says to his disciples. Friends, preaching's fine. I do it myself. It probably has its place. I mean, why, why not, though, focus on the miraculous healing? If you got that kind of gift, why wouldn't you focus on the healing of many, many people and the crowds at the door? Picture this. You've, you've uh, got some pressing uh, personal problem and your pastor, myself, uh, puts a message on the, uh, on the answering machine and on my phone that says, well, um, I've decided I'm going to focus on my preaching. You know, so Monday through Saturday, I am not available for your needs. <laughs> it's, just, uh, that, it's more important for me to stick with the preaching. And uh, I'll see you Sunday and hope you can work that through on your own. Would that last? Would I be able to, you know, kind of last in ministry if I just put you off in the same way that Jesus does here? Preaching is more important than your personal problems, friends. Why was preaching more important than healing? And why did Jesus seem to avoid the crowds and seek time for a lonely prayer rather than encourage more crowd building? Isn't it a function of the Messiah? I mean, that's what Jesus is called here in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. He's called the Messiah, the Son of God. Isn't the work of God to heal? And so if you're going to be the Son of God, if you're going to be the Messiah, wouldn't you be about the healing and not the preaching? Isn't it a good thing that crowds of people are pressing in upon Jesus? Why wouldn't he see that as success and continue in that vein of healing ministry? To Jesus, neither the temple nor the synagogue nor the house in which they're, they're uh, gathered there are to be closed the characteristic of Jesus is to have an open message, a message that continues to go and be preached. It's a mission of the kingdom that he offers. The church should be open doors, just as he understood his mission of always extending that to the next town, to the next neighbor. God's gift, Jesus' grace, transcends all the limits imposed by the dogma of religion. He doesn't want to settle down at Simon's house, see? Even though there's a crowd that's building at the door, he's not going to settle in and just accept that as what his ministry is about. Simon needs Jesus to stay, but Jesus rejects the proposal. If he stayed at Simon's, it would have transformed the movement into him being just another miracle worker, a miracle man who heals at the door of Simon's house. And then you could just show up to Simon's house and experience the healing. Here's the thing. I suspect that Jesus is concerned about the crowds, the success, because he knows that people will follow anybody, almost anywhere, who give them what they want. Friends, Hitler gave people what they wanted, and they gladly followed. Crowds followed even that message. Jesus had come not to draw a crowd or to perform stunning miracles of healing. He had come to preach and to cast out demons in the people and the systems that 
bring about and distort the things of God and God's reign in the world. The new teaching of Jesus and his power to heal are one. They are connected. This theme continues. The summary of that is in verse 39. Jesus goes forth proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. These things go hand in hand. He continues to teach and preach and heal, but he doesn't stay focused on one spot to do so. It's not about the miracle of the healing. He even doesn't necessarily heal everybody that comes to Simon's house, you realize. He doesn't heal. He sees the focus on the message of building the kingdom of God. Mike Graves says that Jesus' preaching and teaching exists that evil might not. That evil would not win the day. Our ministry is to be the same. Note that Jesus' healing is all about relationship. He has a relationship with the mother-in-law and that's what the healing. He touches her and raises her from her illness. It's about the relationship that he's going to be about. It's time for me to go to the neighboring towns and continue to build those relationships and connections that the kingdom of God is to be about. Connected to those who are in need, so should we and our ministry be. Further, I think Jesus sought time alone in prayer because he needed further clarity about his mission. He needed courage to walk the narrow way. He may have struggled with the temptation of fame like anyone would have, but he sought out discernment in prayer, and after that prayer he says, no, it's time for us to move on. We're going to the neighboring towns to continue the preaching ministry that I came out to do. How do you and I tap into that kind of power, that kind of discernment, that kind of understanding of what God is working in the world? I remember in high school, my father and I had the same favorite scripture. It was one of the readings uh, that I could have selected for today. It was from Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31. Um, Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall walk and not grow weary. They will uh, run and not be weary and not faint. It was our favorite for different reasons. I, I like that verse because I was a runner in high school and, uh, and it kind of made me feel like, yeah, I can do this. I can, uh, I can run forever, uh, mount up with wings like eagles, run and not grow weary. I like that scripture for the motivation that it gave me uh, and the symbol of, of accomplishment and success that it, it offered. I never had the occasion to ask my father why Uh, That was his favorite, why he counted his favorite. I just knew that it was his favorite. I know it wasn't because he was a runner, because he he didn't run. He could never really get into running. Um, But I can guess today why it is that my father felt that that scripture was an important one for him. It's the overall message of the hope of the achieving success in one's life. Wings like eagles. Who doesn't like an image like that? How do you and I mount up with wings like eagles? Well, from our look at Mark's gospel this morning, it has something to do with following Jesus' model. Model of servant leadership. As one who stood faithful to God's guidance through prayer. As one who was willing to wait for it. Willing to heal and do so through relationships of compassion and continuing to build those relationships. The identifying characteristics of Jesus' ministry, we learn in this scripture, is that Jesus wasn't looking for worldly worldly fame and crowds, but leading the world to live for God and for the things of God, to usher in the kingdom of God and the grace of God in our midst. We are to live out of that same grace. We are to seek after God's grace. We too will know the truth of Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So be it, and may it be so.